Father, thank you uh, for your presence with us. Uh, thank you for the gift of your spirit who leads and guides us into all truth. Um, so we pray you do that again in the next hour and in the coming hours. Uh, we pray that even the words that have already been spoken today um, will start to make sense um, and will attach themselves to our hearts, to our minds, and uh, will lay bare the gospel for us in the days ahead. Thank you. Amen. All right. Um, this, this, is, uh, this, le this lecture is probably too hard for a freshman lecture, and I'm going to give it to you guys anyways um, because you're smart and because it's good for you. So hang with me. Um, I think you have the handouts, yeah? Good. You should have the handouts. That's, just, that's kind of a rough outline. We'll, we'll be going through that. Um, I did my doctoral work on sin. Um, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, imagine that at parties. What, what are you working on, sin? And I would sort of intentionally leave it at that. And that was fun. Um, but we're also talking about what it means to be human, which is not just to say uh, it is to be sinful. So actually, it's going to be a while before we get to sin. So where to begin? I'd like to start this session on humanity and sin with a simple question. What does it mean to be human? I want to suggest that where most of our descriptions of humanity err is in describing symptoms of humanity without getting to the heart of who that humanity is. In Karl Barth's words, this is like speaking, quote, about knives without edges, or, or handles without pots, or predicates without subjects. It's not, of course, that we aren't all these things as human. Uh, part of being human is being things like rational, being artistic, being capable of complex language and relationships, having a body. But if this is our ending point, or even our starting point for describing humanity, we're liable to miss the forest for the trees. Theological anthropology starts with a problem. God has become a man. He's not just reached out of the sky and intervened in our messed up world. He has entered it and identified with us in the most intimate of ways. And by becoming a man, God has declared once and for all that he will not be God without us, but that he is God with us. He is Emmanuel and no other God. Now, if this is all true, it would seem that the appropriate question to begin with in looking at humanity is not what is humanity, a question which tends towards answers like rational or imaginative or body and soul. Nor should we begin with the question of how, a question with which our mechanistic society is obsessed. Now, the first thing to know about humanity is not how we're put together, not how we work, whether that question is answered biologically, anthropologically, sociologically, or psychologically. The first question for us as Christians is who? And where do we look for, for this answer to the who question than in the one who is both perfectly fully God and perfectly fully human? We're familiar with Jesus' statement that he who has seen me has seen the Father. With that, Jesus upbraids us, even as he rebukes Philip. If we want to know who God is, we go to Jesus. But what we often miss is that Jesus perfectly reveals humanity as well. Hebrews can tell us a lot about this with its description of Jesus as that faithful high priest who was able to represent humanity precisely because he was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So we come to Jesus to learn about God and to learn about ourselves. And this is another reason we start with who, because it is a relational question, a question that can be put in the second person. That is, we ask, who are you, Jesus? rather than simply, who is Jesus in the abstract? That is, we ask a question that involves us, one that is not asked from a safe distance and which might keep us safe from harm. Rather, we enter the fray. We risk ourselves, even in the academic world of theology, knowing that in asking Jesus who he is, his response may very well turn the tables on us and put us into question. But maybe you don't buy all this. Maybe you think we're simply spending far too much time already on Christology and stealing a little too much of the thunder that's coming in the Christology lecture. It's not that you don't think Jesus is important. Of course Jesus is important. 
It's just that this is a lecture on humanity, and we seem to have gotten somewhat off track. Let me read you something from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. These are his Christology lectures. Crazy genius, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Wrote these when he was 29, I think. Bonhoeffer says, Christ is Christ, not as Christ in himself, but, as, but in his relation to me. His being Christ is his being for me. Christ can never be thought of in his being in himself, but only in his relationship to me. Uh, this, that's a strong statement. Christ can never be thought of in his being in himself, but only in his relationship to me. It is not only useless to meditate on Christ in himself, but even godless. Now, when I first read this in grad school, I did not like it. Uh, in fact, I remember an entire afternoon in my dorm room on the east coast of Scotland spent reading this, calling much smarter friends. What? Scotland. Oh, yeah. On the east coast of Scotland. <laughs> Between rounds of golf. Uh, it was nice. It was nice. I won't, I won't lie. I think I was, I was at least 50 yards from the North Sea at that point. Uh, Oh, well, that's why. Well, it's because it's, it's, you're, it's, you're better if you're from Scotland, right? <laughs> Certainly better than from the Bay Area. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Mostly. Um, anyways, we were in my grad room in Scotland before you rudely interrupted my reverie. Uh, I remember spending uh, an afternoon uh, trying to figure out what in the world this means. Um, this is what you guys should do when you're doing your notes, when you're writing your papers, when you're reading your books. Find the stuff that, that drives you crazy and spend the time to figure out what it means. I ran into those sentences and I, um, I, I was disturbed. Um, it seemed like, I, I mean, Bonhoeffer was the kind of guy I trusted, but this was ridiculous. Um, it seemed the height of arrogance to me to suggest that Jesus only makes sense in relationship to me. It seemed that this would box Jesus in. Does, doesn't it make him some sort of therapist whose job is simply to make me happy? Doesn't it threaten God's holiness, his transcendence? See, what Bonhoeffer wants to convince you of is that there's a certain logic to the incarnation, a, a logic which demands that God and humanity be found in the closest possible connection. This isn't a connection that fuses the two, that, that erases the difference, but it is a connection which rejects any attempt to think anthropologically without also thinking theologically. Of course, it also rejects any attempt to think theologically with all, without also thinking anthropologically. The logic of incarnation shows us that who God is, is the one who is with and for us in Jesus. That's who God is. This doesn't involve God being shackled against his will, but rather is a beautiful picture of his own free, self-giving love, a love in which he willingly binds himself to us. Now, further, the logic of incarnation shows us that to be human is to be one of those God is with and for in Jesus. This is where theological anthropology must begin, with the claim that whatever else is true of humans, it is true of us that God is with us, and God is for us. So who are we as humans? I'm going to run through four features of humanity. Uh, first, in looking at Jesus to orient our anthropology, we realize that even describing humanity is an act of faith and of hope. If you, if you think about it, that's, that's crazy. We, we think about ourselves, at least I think about myself, and I know enough of you to know that you do think about yourselves all <laughs> the time. We brood over our relationships, over our emotions, over our past, over our future. Christopher Lash calls America a culture of narcissism. You guys know the myth of Narcissus? Who can, who, real quick, give us, what's the story? Who do you fall in love with? Himself. His reflection. What happened? Yeah. Or he fell in. Uh, was there anyone else in the story? What's the story with Echo? Say that again, Larson. Yeah, that's right. And and she loved him. Loved him. Or he? Yeah. What's that? Oh, I just said loved him. Loved him. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, oh. I'm a little slow. I'm a little slow. I'm a little slow. Good. You get, get the bit with Narcissus. Falls in love with himself, misses this other. Misses this other entirely. Um, Narcissus, the, the thing about Narcissus, uh, he's intimately acquainted with his own face. He is looking in a reflection this far away from his own face in the water. Um, but he doesn't recognize himself. He, he's shockingly ignorant of himself. And, and we know he's ignorant of himself because we know that he was oblivious to the loving advances of others and his own cold disregard for them. He had swelled to fill his own conceptual universe such that the only thing that existed in the cosmos for him was him. The upshot of this, I think, is that if we seek to know what it is to be human by simply looking at ourselves, we will utterly fail. Self-knowledge, this is key, self-knowledge is indirect. It is, as Narcissus unwittingly reminds us, mediated by others in relationship with whom we see ourselves with a clear eye. And even more, as Bonhoeffer has taught us, it's mediated by Jesus. We can only know what it means to be human, but also you can only know what it means to be you by looking at Jesus. And just like our knowledge of Christ, our knowledge of humanity will be a knowledge in faith. It is not something self-evident, but something which must be believed, sometimes despite evidence to the contrary. Further, our knowledge of humanity will be a knowledge in hope. It is an incomplete knowledge, one that is straining towards that last day when the sons and daughters of God will be revealed, a day which all of creation is anxiously longing for, as Romans 8 tells us. Until that day when Christ and humanity be, will be revealed together in glory, our life is hidden with Christ in God. That's Colossians 3. In the meantime, as Jürgen Moltmann writes, humanity is homo absconditus. Humanity is hidden humanity. And because hidden, requiring faith, a faith in that which is invisible, and hope, a hope in that which waits in the future. In his poem on the marriage of heaven and hell, William Blake makes this famous remark that in writing Paradise Lost, Milton was of the devil's part without knowing it. And without a doubt, Satan's character is fuller, more well-rounded than God's. But I want to suggest that this isn't a function of some incipient atheism in Milton, as much as the fact that it is far more difficult to write good than it is to write evil. Indeed, sin and evil are thoroughly imaginable. There's nothing transcendent in them. Evil is not impressive or heroic or even interesting. It's boring. It's trite, passé, stale. We can describe evil because it is, it's just not that creative. What is difficult is describing pure goodness and above all God himself. There are therefore profound limits which are set on our imagination, whether we're discussing protology, the beginning of things, or eschatology, the end of things. Think about Genesis 1 to 3, uh, or Revelation 19 to 22. Next time you, need, uh, you read them, notice how the language strains almost to the point of breaking, to evoke and to provoke, to somehow give you a picture of what a perfectly beautiful creation in Eden and an utterly breathtaking new creation in the New Jerusalem might look like. You just get the sense that language fails, and you're left to worship the God before whom we can only fall silent in delighted awe. Now, second implication of a Christological anthropology concerns the image of God. This is the first place that people normally go in discussing theological anthropology. They start, not without good reason, with the fact that when God creates humans, he creates them in his image. We are uniquely fitted as the only ones among God's gorgeously diverse creatures who are to carry this image. Now, the reason I wanted to wait till now to mention the central category is because the problem with starting with the image of God is that such an approach usually leads to our describing humanity in the image of humanity. Uh, so in the age of rationalism, to be created in the image of God meant, of course, to, to be rational, to be rational. It's a rationalistic age. We value reason. And so to be made in the image of God is just to be rational. In Romanticism, it meant to be endowed with an imaginative capacity, capacity for creating. More recently, theology has been swept up in relational categories, such that people think, uh, frequently describe the image of God in terms of our inherent relationality. 
Now, all this might seem fairly natural, fairly innocuous, but consider that the decision of who counts as a person is frequently tied to the question of the image of God. And it's a short distance between the elevation of certain categories as central to imaging God to the point at which we are excluding, oppressing, even exterminating those who fall outside those categories. It's in light of this sort of move uh, that Ian McFarlane argues that we use the image of God as a negative, limit-setting category and characterize persons, quote, by a process of denying that particular categories of person are the image. So if you think being rational is made in the image of God, what do you do with someone who's severely mentally disabled? Do they count? Are they a person? You have philosophers, ethicists working today who would say something like, no, no, they're not. They, they're, their rationality is so impaired that they're, they're not, that's not a person. Well, that's a problem. Um, so I think the important thing with the image of God is to recognize that it is all inclusive. And there are no, and to deny that any one particular category um, makes a person in the image of God. With, uh, what this helps us see is that the discussion of the image of God is too frequently caught up in the how question rather than the who. Again, if we pick up our cues from the Incarnation, we'll see how frustratingly silent the scriptures are about the mechanics, the how of it all. What's more, the Gospels tell us virtually nothing about Jesus' inner life, something with which we tend to be obsessed. Instead, their focus is on the words and actions of this man which reveal the Father. The scriptures care about who Jesus is and who he reveals. With this in mind, um, let me read to you just really quickly three passages. First is uh, Colossians 1.15. All familiar passages. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Genesis 1, the most familiar passage here. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And Colossians 3.10 talks about us having clothed ourselves, quote, with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. Now notice a few things. First, the image of God is Jesus. The image of God is Jesus Christ. Humanity is said to be made according to our likeness and in the image of God, but is the man Jesus in particular who is the image of God. Only in Jesus Christ, writes Wolfhart Pannenberg, did the image of God appear with full clarity. The Genesis passage shows us that to be made in God's image is to be made for a purpose. It's not so much that we have this thing called an image in us that's sort of like behind my elbow or something. It's that we've been created to correspond to God, to reflect his way of being and doing his life in the world. And this requires living on our part. To be made in God's image is to be projected towards a destiny, to move towards ever fuller fellowship with God and his world. That's why the creation of Adam and Eve is immediately followed by their vocation, by their calling to rule the earth by caring for it and directing it towards its appointed end of glorifying God by doing all that for which it was created. Finally, as the passage from Colossians 3 points out, to say image of God is not only to say Jesus Christ, it's also to say those who are clothed with the new self and are being conformed to Jesus. As we walk in the Spirit, we grow into the image of God, who is Christ Jesus. A third implication of a Christological anthropology is our constitutive relationality. You'll notice that when I defined humanity, I said it's to be one of those God is with and for. The one of those is important. Already in our definition, we know that we are not alone. God is with and for us, but we are also with one another. What Jesus teaches us is that to be human is to be always already in relationships. Who we are is only established in relationship to others. We are individuals who come to have relationships at some point. Rather, we are created already in relationship. Indeed, relationlessness is not only inadvisable, it's impossible. Without the triune God, you wouldn't exist. It's he in whom we live and move and have our being. Following Jesus means following him into relationship, into a life lived with, 
and four others. So Luther uh, puts it this way, characteristically blunt and rich. A Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and in his neighbor. Otherwise, he's not a Christian. All of God's creating and redeeming are for the sake of fellowship, of communion. Consider Jesus' high priestly prayer from John 17, in which he prays, quote, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. It could have been a long time trying to figure out what in the world it means to say, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. And by the way, that's the way the world is going to know that you sent me. Communion, fellowship, is the apologetic, the one thing above all others that speaks to the reality and character of God. Of course, because humanity is relational, we can only know humanity relationally. That's why Narcissus' intense self-regard still failed to yield self-knowledge. He could only know himself in relation to others. Now, much of this strikes a happy chord amongst evangelicals. We talk frequently and rightly about the centrality of a personal relationship with Jesus. This relationship of union and communion with Jesus is at the heart of the gospel. And where the notes sound a little harsher is in their ecclesiological and their missiological payoff. For just as central to the gospel is a commitment to the church and to a particular church, a place where there are people who we don't like. A place, a place that calls for us to put down roots and make a home. I mean, what's, what's church? One of the things, one of the ways to define a church is where people who want nothing to do with one another want something to do with one another. Where people who would never get together, get together. If your church is a place entirely filled with people who would naturally get together, um, you got some problems. If you like everyone in your church, uh, you're either self-deceived or, again, you've got some problems. You need to work on that. Because Christ reconciles people who have nothing to do with one another. Part of being Jesus' brothers and sisters is being part of this new family. And this involves a whole new set of allegiances. What happens when we take Jesus at his word and treat the church as our family? What happens turning to missions when we take Jesus at his word and begin to look for him precisely where we'd rather not? Amongst the poor, amongst the marginalized, amongst the oh so very different. Now, a fourth and final implication of our reflecting from Jesus and the scriptures in which he makes his home relates to the categories of soul and body, spirit and flesh. We need to be careful here to ask the right questions of scripture, following its lead as we do theological anthropology, seeking to trace its logic rather than impose our own assumptions and expectations on it. Scripture doesn't offer us a rigorous definition of the body-soul relationship, for instance, but it is clear about one thing. To be human is to be both soul and body. I think the best way to talk about this is, 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 uh, is to set some boundaries, some rules for Christian talk about the constitution of the human person. And this is the biggest sentence. You ready? All right. Uh, we can draw an analogy. Hang with me. We can draw an analogy to certain Christological heresies by seeking to find a way between the scylla of anthropological docetism and the Charybdis of anthropological Ebionitism. It's big. You good? You with us? We're done. We're done here. Uh, Scylla and the Charybdis. You guys read this long, not long ago, right? Come on, the Scylla and the Charybdis. Come on, they're sort of sailing between these two mean guys. The proverbial rock and a hard place is what we got there. So, we're trying to find a way between the Scylla the Scylla of anthropological docetism and the Charybdis of anthropological Ebionitism. So, if docetism in Christology involves a denial that Jesus is fully human, particularly by arguing that he only seemed to have a human body, anthropological docetism would be any way of construing humanity that saw embodiment as either evil or non-essential. To be human, we must counter, is to be embodied, to have a body, even we might say to be our bodies. The Christian hope is not that we'll fly away, as the old spiritual says. It is that we will live again, that the God who created a universe out of nothing and raised Jesus from the nothingness of death will raise up our decayed bodies to new, beautiful life with him and one another. The Ebionites, on the other hand, argued that Jesus was not fully divine. 
that any sense of divinity he might have had was non-essential. He was a human being born of human parents who was adopted by God and anointed by the Spirit, but he wasn't God. And by, ana by analogy, anthropological Ebionitism would be any way of construing humanity that saw humanity as merely physical, as disallowing that we are somehow more than our bodies, that is, denying that we also have and in some sense are our souls, where some would convince us that we are nothing more or other than the sum of synapses or a collection of desires. The gospel teaches us that we are those women and men who are created for communion with the living God, that we are not simply reducible to crass biological categories. I've got another section here that I just don't have time to read, but it's a quick, it's a quick bit about um, body and flesh. Just be careful as you read the New Testament about body and flesh. Um, I don't want to, oh, I'm going to oversimplify, so just know this is an oversimplification. Body means something like, I don't know, um, your physical stuff. And flesh usually means something like, oh, I don't know, your physical stuff insofar as it stands over against God in a rebellion against him. It's not always going to be that way, but usually, you can flag it for yourself, usually in the New Testament, if I see flesh, bad. And it's not because it's my stuff, per se, it's because the stuff doesn't like God in that moment. And if you see body, usually... You know, just something God made, my stuff. Does that make sense? Um, pay attention to that, though, because it's, it's really easy to sort of miss that um, in there. So to return to the definition we looked at earlier, to be human, first and foremost, is to be one of those for whom God is. God creates a people for himself that he might be for them their God. In creation and redemption, he declares that he will not be God without us. Indeed, that he is God with us and no other God. This is good news indeed. Uh, or is it? Consider that God being for us, that God being for you, means death. Both his and ours and yours in Christ. In turn, our being for and with others takes the form of a continual dying. And by God's grace, but by that alone, rising for the other's sake. To know our fellow humanity with Christ is first to know ourselves made obsolete. Thus, rather than finding God's being for us a therapeutic crutch, it's the God who is for us, hardly the sentimental moniker it might initially appear to be. It's this God who is for us, who we in our sins so doggedly try to escape. What, we do, what do we do but repeat Adam and Eve's vain game of hide-and-seek in the garden? Andrew Del Banco puts it bluntly, Our primal parents run from God, he says, with all the dignity of roaches fleeing the kitchen when the light switch is thrown. We desperately seek anonymity, hoping against hope to blend in, to, to become a mere part of the crowd, to get away into the dark. Christ being for us makes a violent assault on us. It means a catastrophe for us. It means death. And that is the transition to talking about sin. <laughs> so who are we as sinners? As we turn now to look at this question, we return to the who question again. Who are we as sinners? The first thing that must be said is that even we who are sinners are still God's good creatures. We remain good. Now this doesn't mean that what we do is good, that we're morally good, but we never stop being God's good creatures, even in the midst of our vilest sin. In fact, this is what makes sin so painful. It's not natural to us and stands as an utter self-contradiction. Sin is the malfunctioning, the corruption of what remains God's good creation. So, while we're about to talk about the horrible depth and universal scope of sin, it's nevertheless true that we are, that we remain God's good creatures. There's a guy in the 16th century uh, called Flaccius. He was a Protestant Croatian theologian who believed that we were so sinful to warrant being called the image of the devil. But this was rejected, and it was rightly rejected by everyone, in large part because the church has always felt the need to remember, remember that even our, in our sin, we are created in the image of God, and so we are good. As we've offered a relational understanding of personhood, we'll offer a relational understanding of sin. It's certainly true that we, are, are, as sinners, are those who miss the mark, those who disobey God's law. But I'd like to focus on a metaphor which has shown up throughout the Christian tradition, that of the sinner as one who is curved in 
The sinner is one who is curved in on him or herself. To give you a fuller picture of this, uh, let's take a quick, through, through its, uh, quick tour through its use by some theologian. So first, Augustine. Augustine is the Christian source of the metaphor, and he describes the fall as an inclination or, or a turning towards self. This is fundamentally a, a perverse love of self, a, a pride which exalts self above others and upsets the natural orders of loves. It's a love which, it's love, excuse me, which founds the two cities of which Augustine has famously written and of which, about which you'll read soon. He writes, quote, We see then that the two cities were created by two kinds of love. The earthly city was created by self-love, reaching the point of contempt for God. The heavenly city, by the love of God, carried as far as contempt of self. Instead of ordering everything to its fulfillment in the triune God, humanity curved in on itself, shortcuts this flow, and rewires things for its own ends. As sinners, according to Augustine, we use God. We use one another. We use God's good creation for the sake of enjoying ourselves. We become self-complacent. We glut ourselves on ourselves. Get that image? We glut ourselves on ourselves. We pig out on ourselves. Again, Augustine. And what is pride except a longing for a perverse kind of exaltation? For it's a perverse kind of exaltation to abandon the basis on which the mind should be firmly fixed and to become, as it were, based on oneself and so remain. This happens when a man is too pleased with himself. And a man is self-complacent when he deserts that changeless good in which, rather than in himself, he ought to have found his satisfaction. This pride can be traced back to the serpent's promise in Genesis, Genesis 3 that if they ate from the forbidden tree, Adam and Eve would be like God. This was a promise that delighted Adam and Eve. But note, note the horrible irony, and this is an irony that we see in sin again and again. Quote Augustine again, in fact, they would have been better able to be like gods if they had in obedience adhered to the supreme and real ground of their being, if they had not in pride made themselves their own ground. But aiming at more, a man is diminished when he elects to be self-sufficient and defects from the one who is really sufficient for him. In greedily grasping at that which is not ours to demand, we lose the very thing that would be ours if we simply were to receive it as a gift in humble dependence and gratitude to God. The pride of Adam and Eve and our pride leads to a sad competition in which our loves for God, for others, for ourselves continually compete with one another. Rightly ordered, they, they bless one another. They edify one another such that to love God best, I love another. Wrongly ordered, though, they threaten one another. So, for instance, Adam felt torn. Should he obey God and therefore desert his wife? Or should he take the fruit from Eve and thereby desert his God? That's the first time loves came into competition. The strange thing is that even while describing sinful humanity as curved in on itself, Augustine, at several key points in his career, recommends a spirituality in which one turns inward to find God. In this, he leaves an ambiguous legacy. Are we to run from this inward turn in which we sin, or are we to turn uh, inward to lead, uh, to lead us to the Lord? You get the ambiguity there? So it's, the problem is that I'm turning to myself, but also it may be that the thing I need to do to get to God is to turn to myself. So at least on the surface, it's ambiguous. So fast forward about a thousand years to Martin Luther. Luther was an Augustinian monk, and medieval, medieval theology was shot through with Augustine's influence. But Luther had the further factor of being beset by scruples, a spiritual condition bordering on a psychological disorder. Despite continuous confession and seeking of God, Luther was racked with doubts, with anxiety about his salvation. Thus, while he followed Augustine in emphasizing that humanity curved in on itself is fundamentally proud or, or egotistical humanity, he realized that this applies to all of humanity. He meant this in two senses. First, this sin extended to the entire person. There's not a single square inch of the person that is not centered on itself. We're sinners, all of us. Of course, the second sense is that this all of us refers to every one of us, even religious people. Luther, the monk, felt this incurvature severely. 
which led him to the conclusion that the sense that there might be some two-tiered view of people, the holy in the monastery and the profane in the world, that this sense was entirely false. Monks are curved in on themselves too. Listen to his words on the subtlety of sin. It's easy, I say, to understand how in these things, he's talking about sensual evils, we seek our fulfillment and love ourselves, how we're turned in upon ourselves and become ingrown, at least in our heart, even when we cannot sense it in our actions. In spiritual matters, however, that is, in our understanding, our righteousness, our chastity, our piety, it is most difficult to see whether we're seeking only ourselves and them. So there's a sort of common sense that recognizes the ingrown sinfulness of sensuality. Spiritual matters are more subtle, though, and therefore more dangerous for Luther. It's precisely the love of such things. And here again the list. Understanding, righteousness, chastity, piety. It's precisely because the love of these things is such a very good thing that we can slip into treating them as ends in themselves for us. But even doing such self-evidently good things as thinking well and repenting, remaining celibate and praying, these can become a corkscrewed perversion when they're done for the sake of some advantage accruing to us rather than for the sake of God. Luther had a great spiritual advisor, Johannes van Staupitz. Nice word, Staupitz, very fun to say. Staupitz counseled him to reject, quote, this is a quote from a scholar, uh, to reject self-scrutiny as a source of consolation. How many of you turn to self-scrutiny as a source of consolation? Staupitz would say to you, stop it, <laughs> dummy. <laughs> Staupitz counseled, so do I, I'm a dummy too. Staupitz counseled him to reject self-scrutiny as a source of consolation in favor of looking to the wounds of Christ particularly appropriate pastoral counsel for men and women who are curved in on themselves. In line with Staupitz's counsel to look to the wounds of Christ, Luther built a theology of justification and sanctification, but also a renewed sacramental theology which emphasized that which comes to us from outside of us. I am the problem. I ought not look inward to find the solution. I need something alien. Those are the kind of words Luther would use. Alien, foreign, something that is not mine. That's how I need to be fixed. So the issue is not one of turning inward, but of ever being drawn outward into Christ's life. I hope you can hear how radical this program is. I, I don't know about you, but uh, most of my growing up, and still often most of my life, is characterized by an introspective spirituality. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that all introspection is bad by, by any stretch, but I am suggesting that it needs to be subordinated to what is the center of the Christian life, an attending to Jesus, an attending to Jesus rather than ourselves. Now, we're going to talk about Karl Barth in a second, but before we turn to Barth's construal of humanity curved in on ourselves, uh, it's worth mentioning a feminist objection at this point. It's an important one from which I've learned a ton. Uh, in the last 30 years, a number of feminist theologians have challenged this understanding of sin as fundamentally pride. The objection goes something like this. Um, while pride is the most basic form of sin for men, it's not for women. And in fact, women tend, tend towards the opposite. They, they tend towards sloth. Rather than swelling up to fill the room and dominating a relationship, women tend to shrink to a point to lose themselves in their relationships. Where men are full of themselves, Women empty themselves to the point that they have little, if any, selves left. Now, if this diagnosis of sin is true, a differing redemption will be called for. That's part of the objection. Where, where proud men need to be humbled, to be broken on the rock of Christ, to be crucified with Christ, women who have lost themselves need to be healed need to find themselves, need to be encouraged to speak again, to be urged to live the lives God has called them to in Christ. The danger of applying the remedy of humility which suits proud men to slothful women is that it will actually underwrite their own sinning. If women struggle with self-hatred, then think how easily the prescription of humility can simply further their project of self-destruction. <laughs> 
So you already hate yourself. Well, you need to be humble. You think way too highly of yourself. Why are you always talking about yourself when you hate yourself? Think, too, of how many Christian men have used this kind of logic to justify abusive or at least manipulative relationships with their wives, with their girlfriends. Men who strangely seem to forget the application of humility in their own lives. Now, such a brief overview of this objection is, is filled with caricatures, and the objection itself is far too wedded to gender. Uh, one feminist recalls having taught these ideas in a classroom when a black woman re retorted that sloth is not a black woman sin. <laughs> but one thing, one thing we can learn from the objection is that an uncritical description of sin as pride can have dangerous pastoral consequences, which should tell us that something is theologically deficient as well. In light of all this, it's significant that when Karl Barth, uh, early, ha early half of the second, early first half of the, early part of the 20th century, that's what I meant to say. When Karl Barth describes sinful humanity curved on in itself, in on itself, he speaks of three forms of sin. Of pride, the thing that we talked about in the beginning, but also of sloth and of falsehood. We're familiar enough with pride by now to leave it to the side. Uh, falsehood is the sinful human counter witness to the word of truth spoken to us in Christ. That is, in Christ, God tells us that he's for us and that he's for us in a particular way by being against our vain attempts to take care of things on our own. Falsehood consists in our rejection of the truth about God, which is also the truth about us. It is our rejection of the person of truth, of Christ himself. What interests us here, though, is Bart's take on sloth. We've just been speaking of pride and sloth as two different realities, yet Bart can see them as two sides of the same coin the coin of being curved in on ourselves. So this is Bart. The sin of man is not merely heroic in its perversion. It is also ordinary, trivial, mediocre. The sinner is not merely Prometheus or Lucifer. He's also a lazy bones, a sluggard, a good-for-nothing, a loafer. If pride is, as Bart calls it, the counter-movement to the divine condescension, in Christ, sloth is the counter movement to the elevation which has come to man from God Himself and Jesus Christ. Sin is our refusal of God's coming to us, but it's also our refusal of our going to Him in Christ. That is, Christ has risen and ascended and gone to the Father. And our sin is refusing to uh, know ourselves as seated uh, at the right hand of God in Christ. Sloth is a is like a hedgehog. This is Bart's image. Sloth is like a hedgehog who rolls himself into a ball and stubbornly refuses to be drawn out of himself. But note that whether it's in the form of a proud self-exaltation or a slothful self-denigration, a perverse passion or an anemic apathy, the sin has the same shape. It is a curving in on ourselves in the form of a refusal of God's gift to us in Jesus. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah writes. We have turned every one to his own way. Now Bart's careful as he unfolds the logic of sin. He says something like this, uh, sin is impossible. By this he means that given what we know about humanity in Christ, given what God has done in Christ, sin is simply not one of the real options left for us. We are God's children and sin is impossible. Yet, Bart hastens to add, it's a fact. We do sin, and we sin heinously. And yet again, uh, sin, sin is futile. Sin is destined to fail. This is Bart. The falsehood of man is ultimately only his falsehood. That is, we may imply, it is not God's falsehood. The man of falsehood has not turned God's truth into a lie, and can never do so. God is with and for us in Jesus. That's the truth. No matter how much I lie to hide myself from that. It's in the middle of these competing realities, a redeemed world in which sin is impossible, a world in which Christ has defeated sin, death, and the devil, and yet a world in which sin happens all the time. It is in the midst of these that Christians live. We are, as Augustine and Luther and Bart all confess, though in different ways, simul justus et peccator. We are simultaneously righteous 
and sinful. Those are both true things about us. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.